let's talk about business organizations. So one of the roles of a startup lawyer, like the type of lawyer that Alpha Lab needs, is a lawyer that can understand uh, the business needs of its uh, 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 clients. And so, you know, getting in the mindset of being a business lawyer is really different from being a litigation attorney, even a business litigator. I mean, you know, lawyers, lawyers get a bad rap because they, they seem to always be looking for problems, you know, things that people did wrong, you know, catching someone and, and finding a way to sue and, and things like that. And, and business lawyers really have a different mindset. The business deals only happen, they only work when there's a meeting of the minds, where there's some consensus, where there's some agreement. Uh, because people only get involved in a deal when they both feel that they're going to benefit from it. So you need to have that mindset. How do I achieve someone's perspective? How do I help them meet their goals? And that involves a lot of listening. You have to really understand what those goals are, but then it involves processing that through your legal knowledge, your legal filter. And the first step is helping make that, that critical organizational choice. And we went through some of the basics. Of, uh, of business associations. And so what did we learn last week? Well, we talked about the basic choices, those basic choices being partnerships, both general partnerships and limited partnerships, uh, corporations, both in forms of uh, S corporations and C corporations, and limited liability companies, uh, which have a member managed and a manager managed capacity. We briefly spoke about sole proprietorships. It's when a person just runs a business and has all the liability. We broke down partnerships into limited partnerships and general partnerships, and we talked about their essential aspects, their formation, their liability, uh, how they're managed and controlled, their financial rights, their uh, continuing con continuity of existence, what happens if someone withdraws, can they effectively cause the business to stop operating or extort them for money? Are those interests transferable? Is that the design of it, or is it meant to be kept within a group of people? And what happens with mergers? Um, we talked a little bit about uh, planning considerations. We're going to talk more today about the tax consequences from these choices. I'm not a tax lawyer, uh, but uh, I have learned a thing or two about tax, and so I'm going to try to step you through some of the tax analysis. And we're going to then wrap up today's class by applying all that we learned last week and all that we're going to review and cover this week to hypothetical situations for a particular client. Uh, my Green Home, uh, a group formed by uh, two individuals that are looking to go into business as co-adventurers for profit. And this is a very helpful exercise for you to think through because you're going to be assessed on the uh, exam with a series of questions that are very similar. It's going to be a slightly different fact pattern, but it's going to be a very similar situation where you're going to have to reason through why certain organizational choices would be uh, better or worse for a given set of entrepreneurs. And you'll need to filter their business needs through your legal lens. There's no necessarily right or wrong answer, but there are some better answers. There are some choices in all this that can be ruled out right at the beginning, and we'll talk about ruling out the choices that are obviously wrong, and then sort of triaging what's left and sort of uh, you know, explaining why some choices would be better than others. And also, always there's going to be additional facts and follow-up, so the third thing would be to think about what else do I need to know to make this choice? Do I have enough information to make a choice, or do I want to interview the founders a little more? What else would I need to know? So again, the three things you have to do, kind of rule out the choices which are clearly wrong, triage the choices which seem plausible, and then third, ask questions that would help you determine which of those choices is best. There might be a slam dunk answer, but usually there's a couple different entities that you could select from based on some other facts, and so pointing out which of those facts are going to be necessary is going to be very helpful in getting to the answer because you know in a real client situation you would have the opportunity to dialogue with that client to ask follow-up questions and so we're going to sort of simulate that in this hypothetical and on the exam to help you get some of that basic intuition and that vibe of being a business lawyer helping with business planning all right so let's meet the client. It all begins with meeting the client. And our client for this hypothetical is found in your book. You should have read it. Oh, and by the way, I, I really appreciate all the work that you have all done. I hope you know I appreciate that because for the rest of this entire semester, you know, there's 70 pages of reading. So uh, I, I recognize that the midterm required a substantial amount of effort. And I hope you realize I recognize that by the fact you have literally 70 pages of reading for the rest of this course. 
Uh, but it is a bit dense, I recognize that as well, and we're going we're gonna to take a couple weeks to work through it all. So please do keep up with the reading, because despite there being only 70 pages, that actually sort of, in a way, elevates their importance, so this would not be a good time to, to, skip, uh, to skip your reading. It is a very limited amount of reading, but it is all pretty important, and, and here what's important is how that hypothetical plays out for these individuals, because we're going to meet the entrepreneur, we're going to assess their business needs, we're going to make recommendations for organizational choices, we're going to talk about forming that entity, and then authorizing it to conduct business. And those are going to be our kind of three modules, three chapters, three components to get us to the finish line. So we, we want to start with the people involved, and, and we're going to try to understand who they are and, and what they want. And so in this particular hypothetical, you're approached by an individual named Brandon and an individual named Anita. And Brandon is a mechanical engineer. Imagine that he went to Carnegie Mellon. He has time. He's looking for a job. He wants to work. He's just graduated Carnegie Mellon, and so he's looking to put his newfound degree to work, and he has aspirations to be in a startup. You know, very popular these days being a startup. You can make a lot of money, and he's young and willing to take some risk, doesn't have any money, but has time, and he has some management skills. He had previously worked in business, and he had uh, has some management experience. So he, he would play the role most likely of a manager, going based on his background, but we're going to try to see a little bit more about what he has to say about that. Anita, on the other hand, she's actually a full-time journalist. She's employed, and uh, unlike some of you who work full-time and go to school full-time and take care of families full-time and other things, and you know, Anita is, 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 is basically all full up with being a journalist. It's occupying 60 hours a week, uh, but she's been successful. She's written a couple books, she's gotten a couple good publication deals, and so she has money something Brandon doesn't have. And this might be a good relationship. You know, she's, she has some capacity to, uh, to understand publicity and marketing, and she's going to help out, but uh, and she also has some background in finance. So she has money, understands finance. On the other hand, Brandon, who has engineering skills and management. And so uh, they want to form a company called My Green Home, which is going to install, uh, is going to design and install solar panels on, on home roofs. Maybe not so popular in Pittsburgh. I think I, my, uh, they, you know, you ever, you ever go to the Home Depot and they have the stand there and they plug your address into the computer? It's depressing. I think I was like, I scored like a 24 out of 100 on the solar panel score. So, um, you know, maybe not the industry for here, but uh, you, you can imagine sunnier climbs, the value here. So, given what we've heard about these two people, they walk in your door uh, and um, are you prepared to make a decision? What, what type of entity should they form? Okay, GPLP structure, we're going we're gonna to put that on the table as an LP. Any other suggestions? Yeah. LLC. Sure, an LLC. That's, we're going to find that LLC is almost always an option so long as we need the flexibility. has more cost. It's a little more complex. If it, but sometimes that extra cost is justified, right? An LLC could provide the same structure as an LP. Depends on how we structure it. It can be like a partnership. It can be like a corporation. What else could we... Could we install here? S-corp? Could be an S-corp, right? Could be an S-corp and very easy to have separate management and control. So, you know, maybe Brandon is going to be the manager. He doesn't have to be a stockholder. Anita could form the corporation, be the sole stockholder. Brandon could be the manager and she could get flow through benefits. And maybe she doesn't want flow. We don't really know her tax situation. So, you know, maybe a C-corporation. Maybe she wants to block from that tax liability. Maybe she wants to get other investors uh, later. Maybe a general partnership. Maybe she wants to have, maybe this involvement with finances could constitute some level of control, and she actually does care about that. The truth is, at this point, we don't have enough information to make a decision. We don't have enough information at this point. We need to know a little more. We need to know fundamentally what do the individuals intend to give to the business? What is their intentions? What's their objectives? And what do they more fundamentally want to receive? I mean, we know what skills they have, but we don't know at this point what skills they want to provide, and we don't know what they want back at all. We don't know whether they want money. We don't know whether they want interest. We don't know whether they want share of the profits. We don't know if they want salary. So we need to ask them some questions about the party's expectations. 
The party's expected contributions, you know, would probably be based on their resources. But um, and we know we know then that um, let's go a little far. Let, let's suggest then that Brandon expects to dedicate uh, primarily time. So if he wants to dedicate time, we also might ask, does he even need to be a co-investor? Maybe he's just an employee. So we shouldn't forget that a typical relationship, one person has a business, the other employs the other. We don't know from these set of facts that Brandon needs to be involved in the management at all. This could be a sole proprietorship where uh, uh, Anita simply employs Brandon and, and pays him a salary for his time. So we need to understand his risk portfolio. Does he want to have a chance at making a thousand times an investment? Does he want a chance of getting stock options that are very valuable? Or does he need to feed his family and he needs a paycheck every week? So we don't know that at this point, and it's important not to jump to conclusions. At this point, knowing what we know, basically every organizational forum is still on the table. So helpful hint, I'm not going to give you something this open-ended, right? Because it would just be a, a question of resus uh, recitation. So we're going to talk about these organizational choices again. Uh, go through all that, and then at the end of today's class, we're going to then play through those hypotheticals with a little more granularity so you know how to advise them. All right, let's see how we'll remember last week. What's a general partnership? This is a um, 50-50 share of the... I, know, I mean, I know that the liability is like equally shared between the two. Like, you're, you're just as much liable for the other party. Yeah, so um, liability, so general partnerships have no limited li have unlimited liability. That's one characteristic. How are general partnerships formed? Automa yeah, they can happen automatically. They can happen accidentally, right? It's, an, it's simply defined as an association of two or more persons to carry on a business for profit. And so it's something that can be formed very easily. It costs nothing to form one. They can be formed by act of law simply by engaging in business together. So formation is free, but also can happen accidentally, which can be a problem. And it can result in unlimited liability. Now, when I say unlimited liability, I don't mean half-half. I mean both are fully liable for everything. So whoever, uh, so either can be left holding the entire bag. If you're in a 50-50 partnership, it does not mean you're liable for half of the debt. If that business runs up a million-dollar debt, that debt collector can go against any of the partners. If there are 50 partners, all of them are joint and severally liable for that entire debt, which means that they have to pay the debt. If someone wants to sue one partner out of 50, that person, if they lose, will have to pay and then have to seek contribution from the others. Each of them is joint and severally liable. The liabilities are not split half. You're not liable for just half. Everyone is liable for the whole thing. That's what unli unlimited liability means. Do you have a question? I do. So does that often impact um, who is permitted to be a partner? Is that a consideration for people? Because if they're insolvent, they don't want to be left holding. So if you get involved in a partnership with someone who has zero dollars, they are essentially uh, judgment proof, right? There's no one, there's nothing to take from. And the other partner, the wealthy partner, that's going to be the litigation target. So absolutely something you would think about. And in addition, that person might be more risk taking because they have nothing to lose. I mean, if you're in a partnership and you're both fully liable, but one person has a million dollars to lose and the other has literally nothing to lose. That person who has nothing to lose might take risks that the person who has a million dollars to lose might not. So that's called an agency cost. And so both are agents of the business. Both can bind the business. If you have one person who's going to have a much greater risk-seeking type of behavior, you may not want to partner with that person. That may be a bad fit from a relationship perspective. And yes, in terms of who's going to have the crosshairs on their back if the debt collectors come to sue, I mean... We all have that sensibility, right? Litigators follow the money. You're not going to sue someone who's broke. What's the point of that? You might get a judgment. You're never going to get paid. They'll sue the guy with a million bucks. So a general partnership has a lot of risk to it. So, you know, uh, in addition, if you don't form a partnership agreement, which costs some legal dollars to put together, uh, there's going to be a lot of questions about how that business is managed. So it is easy 
but it's rarely the right choice because of that liability. So it's, it's one that we can usually dispense with pretty quickly in any type of business that could incur liability. If they're coming to your office and they're asking you for legal advice, do you think they want to walk away with a situation where they could lose their home, their money, their bank account, their savings? They're looking for protection. And so a general partnership is rarely going to be the right choice, but still it's something to discuss. We're going to step through the choices. It's one of those easy ones we can usually knock out for any business that might incur liability. In the case of my green home, let's apply that here, you know, they're installing solar panels on people's roofs. Could anyone see a situation where that could cause liability? Yeah, what if a worker falls off the roof? It's a $5 million lawsuit. 33-year-old guy with two kids falls off a roof. You know the jury's in Pennsylvania. What's the wrongful death going to be on that one? Do you want to pay $5 million? Probably not. Probably not. In addition, if you're going to be buying solar panels and warehousing them, you're going to have a lot of inventory. And so you're going to owe debts to those suppliers because you've got a lot of inventory that you have to pay for in advance, maybe pay on credit. You'd be personally liable for that if you don't sell those solar panels. And see how the weather holds up, but that's an issue. If you're, in a, if you're in the business of installing solar panels, you may also damage someone's roof, cause property damage in the process. You know, we have some older homes in this area. My home was built in 1924. I'm not sure it could handle the weight of a solar panel on the roof. Do you want that liability? Solar panel comes crashing through a roof, goes, kills my dog. That's a, long, that's a lawsuit, right? Personally liable, unlimited liability, right? So a lot of risks going on here. So, but it's important, and I'm trying to reiterate, that it's important to address those risks and not just ignore them, not just skip the entity choice. It is one of our choices. It does form by default, but I want you to address why it's usually not a good fit. It's, this is one of the easier ones to deal with, but I do want you to talk about that as you step through the choices, you can usually dispense with it pretty quickly. It's rarely the right choice. How about a limited partnership? What is a limited partnership? How is it different than a general partnership? Yeah, Danielle. Great. And why would a person be uh, uh, passive? Why would they choose to be passive? Because you don't have any exposure to liability. Right. So the limited partners also don't have liability. So this structure is a little bit better for certain types of organizations. The general partner is still going to have unlimited liability, but we can solve that. How do we solve that? We talked about the solution, the common solution last week. You make a, yeah, you make a corporation the general partner, and then the corporation is liable, and that blocks the liability, but that adds expense. Is it worth the expense? I mean, we've actually seen the development of limited liability companies to address exactly that situation, so you don't need that additional blocking entity, that liability blocking entity. But, you know, this type of form is very popular for a very particular type of uh, business. What type of business usually prefers the LP form, almost for historic reasons? Investment funds do. Investment funds and being, being an LP is almost a sign of being an investment fund. I mean, for one thing, investment funds have a lot of money. And so the cost of having a blocking corporation, $200 a year, look, if you've got $500 million under management, $200 a year doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. I mean, it's basically inconsequential. And if you're able to raise money even one fiftieth easier, if you have it even slightly less legal, I mean, you can sneeze those legal fees if you're, if you're building an LLC, right? So for a complicated LLC with a big management structure and everyone has to read an 80-page operating agreement, LPs are more generally understood. It's sort of the standard form for an investment uh, firm or an investment vehicle in a firm, really. Venture, it's really, a, it's really even a fund. I wouldn't even call it the firm. The firm might have a partnership structure uh, or an LLC structure. But the actual investments themselves are usually done through funds, and those funds are LPs. So when I see a limited partnership, I think investment fund, and, and I think you should go in that direction too. It really, its, it's advantage is historical. People are used to them. You can use an LLC to do the same thing, but LLCs don't have the same connotation. And um, you know, the, I guess the other reason, which is a little bit less marketing and maybe a little more sensible, is that people who are investing in funds they're used to being limited partners. They've been limited partners before. They know what a limited partner agreement should look like. They know what to look for. They're aware of the rules and the law. So you know, you're going to try to make it easy for your investors. You make it easy for your investors by being ordinary, by being vanilla, by not being too complicated. 
So if you could do that through an LP, that might be a good reason to spend 200 bucks a year on a corporation. But you know, usually, you know, and, and it's worth talking about. I mean, if you see a relationship of a real operating business, okay, it's worth talking about the LP structure because you know, let's say Anita is just money, but there is an issue with being an LP. What is an LP allowed to do under Pennsylvania law? Basically nothing, right? They have to be passive. And so if Anita wants any involvement in the business whatsoever, an LP structure is not going to work for her. If she does want to be totally passive and you know, she wants to feel like an investor and, and, and be an investor in a, essentially a fund, uh, this is a colorable choice. And we can set up a blocking corporation to prevent liability for Brandon. We certainly, I mean, we certainly don't want, and Brandon doesn't have a lot of money, but he might someday. I mean, this, let's say this business works out. Brandon will become wealthy. So it's not that he's going to be hopefully broke forever. He's broke now. He just graduated CMU. He's got student debt, but he's trying to start up, hoping to make something of himself. He's not going to be broke forever. And so we want to make sure he's protected in the long run. So we, if we're going to set up a GP structure, we want to think about liability for the GP. We want to think about a blocker corp. And again, we ask, is it worth the cost? Why? Why are we doing it this way? Well, if there's historic reasons, simplicity reasons for attracting multiple outside investors, sure. Otherwise, uh, less likely. All right, the corporation. Corporation suitable for specific purposes. What's a, what's, what are the features of a corporation that make it different from these other forms? Centralized management. Unlike a partnership structure where you have to have either a totally passive member and a centralized management of GPs, you have sort of professional, and you can, you won't necessarily, but you can have professional management. You can hire people who manage the company, and there's a separation of management uh, and ownership. And so that can be very helpful for certain types of companies where you want to bring in an outside manager. I have a, a twist on the hypothetical later where we have Anita and Brandon who both want to be investors. They want someone else to run the company. That looks more like a corporation, especially if they may want to get rid of their investment because corporations have transferable interests. It's fairly easy to sell your share. So if these are short-time players, if Anita wants to get in, has the opportunity to get out, if Brandon wants to be able to maintain the company even if Anita wants her money out, if he wants the capital to be tied up until the company decides to let her go, the corporation is a great choice, and the only reason not to choose it at this point is for tax reasons, because corporations have a feature that we'll discuss called double taxation, but if we can get into the S-corporation checkbox, we can avoid that corporate taxation. We're going to talk about S-corporations a little later in the lecture today as we talk about tax implications. So in a corporation, the shareholders simply provide capital, although they do have more control than an LP. Why? What can shareholders do that an LP cannot? Vote. They can vote. They can vote for the directors, and so they can exert pressure on the directors. And so if Anita has all the shares, she has all the power, and she might appoint someone to be a director, but she can then remove that director much more easily than an LP could remove a GP. So an LP, remember, especially in Pennsylvania, has no power whatsoever, is entirely passive. A shareholder in a closed corporation is going to have some more power than that, and some additional transferability of their interests. It's a little bit of more of a fungible commodity, a share in a corporation. That clear separation of ownership and control may or may not be desirable. We have to play that tape forward a little bit to see where we get to. Um, the other thing is that it's a very clear structure about authority. So as, uh, as was mentioned, a corporation has centralized management. What does that mean? It means the board of directors has to get together as a whole and vote on major things. It's very clear who acts for the corporation, and it's very straightforward. If you have a partnership with a number of partners and they all run around with authority to bind the company, you know, a, a partnership can end up being uh, involved in deals that maybe a majority of the partners wouldn't want. It has much more decentralized management. Here we have a clear structure. On the other hand, Right, Anita is not going to have much authority. Voting for the directors once a year, if that, that's not a lot of power, not a lot of authority. She is owed some duties, but as we will see next semester, it's hard for her to sue about that. So again, a corporation is going to be a useful entity in a number of areas, especially when you want to have centralized management, when you want the separation of ownership and control. Uh, but you don't want to give up complete authority. You don't want to be, you know, run roughshod over. And there's going to be, and, and, you know, it also has the advantage of, of perpetual existence. So 
you know, the corporation will keep that capital for an indefinite period of time, so it's a long haul kind of business. It's also a good form to attract outside investors because people are used to buying shares in a corporation. And you know what you're getting. If the corporation has 1,000 shares and you have 100 of them, you own 10%. So it's pretty clear uh, what you own. In a partnership, you know you have to negotiate everything separately. But shares are shares are shares. 10 out of 100 is 10%, and that's your rights uh, for voting. That's your rights for distributions. That's your rights for dividends. So corporations are really straightforward, and that has an advantage in many, many cases. And so it's a form that we're going to learn a lot about in this class, and it, it is the form that uh, large Fortune 500 companies have adopted. I actually read a statistic today which was astounding. Apple is the uh, uh, wealthiest corporation in America right now, and uh, I was shocked at this. They receive 16% of all the revenue of all the businesses in America. It's an unbelievable concentration of wealth. The top three corporations in America, uh, top five, sorry, the top five corporations in America, which at least when I read this report, Apple, uh, Alphabet, which was Google, um, uh, Microsoft, Cisco, and um, I'm blanking on the last one. Uh, so that, uh, I don't know the last one. I'm uh. just asking. Of all the revenues that all the businesses generate in America, Apple had Apple posted $229 billion in revenue, and the statistic that I read said that American businesses generated $1.4 trillion in revenue in 2017, which shows that Apple had a 16% share of all the revenues generated. I believe I think that statistic might have been their worldwide revenues, and this, you know, so it was hard to get the numbers to. It, it, was, a, it was an unbelievable vast percentage. Uh, 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 of American revenue going to a very, very small number of corporations. That's what I wanted to clarify. That's a the top 1% of corporations hold 50% of the cash that all corporations hold. So if you think that the whole 1% thing is a, is a big deal in personal wealth, it's even more magnified in corporate wealth. Question? So that's consumer revenue, not revenue? I think it was both. I think it was both. Yeah. It was, hard to get the, it was hard to get the statistics. The statistics came from the Census Bureau. They did a 2015 uh, census and uh, the Small Business Association. And I'm kind of spitballing just to kind of make the point. I mean, I'm not, you don't cite me on this one. But, but Google it, I, and the numbers that I saw showed $1.4 trillion in total U.S. receipts revenues for uh, businesses registered in the United States and $229 billion for Apple. So in any event, it's a, the cash position alone is astounding. I mean... You know, when you add up the five largest corporations, they have a third of all the cash that all corporations hold, all the liquid cash. It's an unbelievable concentration of wealth. It's been very effective at concentrating wealth. It's not appropriate for all situations, though, especially in small businesses. It does have that double taxation. And the double taxation, at some point, you won't be able to get around it. You can't zero out all your income. You can't form an S-corporation in a lot of contexts. And... Um, you know, it doesn't have certain flexibilities to it. So, you know, that separation of ownership and control, that may not be what the founders desire, which is why the limited liability company often comes up. And in addition, in addition to the corporation very frequently being a valid choice, at least an S corporation, the LLC has many, many features that make it always something to talk about. You should always consider the LLC because it has such flexibility. It can be many different things. It can function like an investment fund or you have a manager managing it and members who are passive. They could be fully passive, like an LP is required to be fully passive, or the operating agreement could give them some additional control rights. And you can set up the distributions however you want. You don't have to have the distributions tied to the contributions. In a corporation, your share is based on how many shares you bought. Your percentage is based on how many shares you paid for. And that says how much you're going to earn. It's very straightforward, but you may not want it that way. It may be that a person who works gets a share, even though they contributed no money or small amount of money. You may want a 50-50 share. I brought the rake and you brought the lawnmower, right? Very different values of our capital contributions, but maybe we have an agreement to, to split the profits 50-50. An LLC can achieve that. We can really set up the plumbing, we can pull all these levers, and we can write a fairly complex operating agreement to get things tuned in just the way we want. But don't go running to the LLC every time. Because that flexibility comes at a cost. I mean, we're going to spend next week and the week following going over the documentation to build a corporation. You're going to leave this course with the capacity to form a corporation. You are not going to leave this course 
And in fact, even if I taught an entire course on it, it would be hard for you to leave with the capacity to build an LLC. You'd have to understand ramifications of tax law, about partnership law, and various other things which are quite complex. So an operating agreement for an LLC, at least with multiple members, could be 60, 70, 80 pages. And it's hard to understand. There's a bunch of different tax ramifications. You have this flow through status. You have issues of what's called phantom tax. If the business earns money and doesn't distribute it, the partners may owe that tax, even though they didn't receive the cash. The cash may be stuck in the business for one reason or another. And then the members of that company, the, the tax flows through to them, so they owe the tax, but they don't have any cash to pay it. And so that phantom tax is going to be an issue. Uh, and, and you have to work around all of these things. So like I said, I'm not, it's not a course on LLCs. And, and I actually I spend a, a full week on it in venture capital law to understand the LLC operation. It's really a week and a half to uh, introduce it. And, and that really only scratches the surface. They're really, they're really complex. So the flexibility, you only really want to use them when the flexibility is, is important. There is the advantage, however, that you can have flow through taxes, meaning no corporate taxation, even if you don't meet the standards for an S corporation. So we're going to get to this in a minute, but in order for it to be an S corporation, all the shareholders have to be US taxpayers. Not true of an LLC. So anytime you have a foreign investor, you want to really strongly consider the LLC if you're looking for flow through benefits. Because if you can't make the S corporation status and you're concerned about the taxation, then the LLC might pay off. This is a high revenue business. If there's going to be a lot of money flowing through this business, you don't want to be paying double taxation on all that money. And if you can't make the S corporation election because you don't meet the standards, and we'll go over, there are five standards that have to be met for an S corporation. If you can't meet those standards, an LLC is an excellent choice because you will be able to enjoy perpetual flow through, flow through tax treatment, if that's what the founders want, as well as whatever structure you need at a higher startup cost. The other problem with an LLC is because of the complexity, because of the flexibility, each one is a little bit different. And so investors are more wary to invest in them because they don't know what they're getting without taking a very careful look. And so you come to someone and you want $10,000 and it would cost $10,000 of legal fees for them to review the agreement, they're probably just going to say no. Whereas a corporation, again, it's much more clear what they're investing in, and people make small investments into corporations all the time, in part because they know what they're going to get for that share. It's much more straightforward. So the, the flexibility can be very helpful, and it can be very helpful, especially when you're not able to get flow through status with an S corporation because you blow the S election. Then it might really pay off. But before you charge your clients five times what it would normally cost to make a company, make a corporation, and before you get involved in something complex that you may not have the capacity to do without reaching out to tax counsel and learning about partnership law, and uh, uh, you, know, you, you might want to think twice about that. Um, the other aspect, which is, a, which is, a, is, which is an issue, uh, it comes up less here, but something to think about is that we're going to learn about bail piercing, which is the doctrine that says that we're not going to honor limited liability. So shareholders generally have limited liability, but we will spend two weeks on a doctrine that explains when a debtor or a tort, whole, uh, someone, uh, not a tort, the tort fees is the one who commits the tort. What's, is there a word for the person whose tort was committed against? The tort fees? <laughs> the, the plaintiff, no, I mean the plaintiff here. The tort fees would be the defendant. The tort fees is the defendant. The plaintiff in a tort case, I'm gonna call the tort fees. So, you know, you got a tort fees, and they're going to come after the shareholders, and they're going to have some ability to get to the shareholders in certain cases in closely held businesses. We understand that law pretty well. I will teach it to you. I will give you what I call a piercing scorecard, a set of factors. I will rank those factors. I will make it very, very clear when piercing is likely in a corporation. I cannot give you such a scorecard for LLCs. The law is not that well developed. And so there is just more risk. There's just more risk. They've only been around since 1992. We adopted a newer version of the statute, what was it, 2001 or 2007. So, I mean, this is a very, there aren't that many of them. There aren't that many lawsuits. Every state has a different law. I, I just can't tell you when they're going to pierce. And, and that's, a, that's, a, that's a risk. And so you would at least need to inform your clients that down the road, you know. Now, this is less relevant, as we'll see. Piercing doesn't happen in larger companies where there's multiple shareholders. It has to do with the concept of uh, the company being the alter ego and sort of the instrumentality of the shareholder or the owner 
or the member. Uh, so if you have two people, that's a real risk. If you have 10 people, it's not really a risk. But um, piercing drops precipitously. Most, most piercing happens if you have one person. And speaking of one person, a single member LLC is easy. A single mem member LLC is very easy to set up. You only need, it's basically a one page document because you're not dealing with tax, you're not dealing with all these levers. There's, there's, there's no, there's only one holder. So he gets all the profits, she gets all the profits. Right. Oh, and by the way, just as an aside, you can elect to have the LLC taxed like a corporation too. I mean, truly flexible. And under Pennsylvania law, the LLC can convert from a manager managed to a member managed and back again without any additional filings. Huge amounts of flexibility. The question is, is the flexibility worth the cost? Is the flexibility worth the liability risk? And so, you know, you want to put on your lawyer hat and balance those things out. Finally, I want to mention a sole proprietorship. A sole proprietorship is just when a single person goes into business and does not do any work to protect themselves. Um, a single proprietor can hire an employee and pay them a salary. A single proprietor can take out a loan and owe a debt. And in both cases, that single proprietor maintains complete and exclusive control. Now, it's free, and it's easy, and they can walk out of your office and do it tomorrow. Of course, the risk is the unlimited liability. But for companies that um, can't afford your bills, or bills and for, you know, this is, the person's only responsible for their own actions, except to the extent that they have an employee, and then there may be the doctrine of respondeat superior, it's an agency principle, let the uh, uh, superior answer. So uh, sole proprietorships are worth considering if it's really just one person running a business. I mean, people do do that, but you have to inform the client that they're fully liable for any torts or debts of that business, fully personally liable. There's no insulation for that person. So it's something to mention. But uh, just like the uh, general partnership, it is usually not going to be your best choice for any company that could incur liabilities. I mean, if it's, you know, if it's a kid doing a lawn care business, you know, in the summertime, maybe, maybe that's fine, you know, I mean, because liability is pretty limited for something like that. It's not zero. You can still run over someone's hose or, you know, maybe injure someone if possible. But, you know, you, you weigh the costs and benefits. Or is that, does that kid want to spend... $10,000 over the course of five years on various filing fees and startup costs to make a couple bucks. And so, you know, if that's the kind of client that comes in your door, I, I think the answer there is maybe, maybe, you, maybe you go ahead and you take that risk. But if it, the problem, though, in a par it's worse in a partnership where then you have the risk of someone else's actions. You can control your own actions to a certain extent. But if you have a partner that's, you know, running roughshod and, and you know, so a general partnership is even riskier than a sole proprietorship for that reason. Do you have a question? Uh, was, yeah, aside from the liability aspect of it, um, being a sole proprietor, um, would you agree that it's harder to, you know, it's more challenging to get funding or... Um, well, there is no concept of funding. There is no concept of funding. The only way a sole proprietor gets funding is with a bank loan. Right. You can't I, I sell a share in that business. There is no concept of share. Right. There is only one owner. Okay, I, I was just... I, I, mother started her own business a couple of, um, actually about 10 years ago, um, and her biggest hurdle, but once the business was open, everything was great. The biggest hurdle for her was going to banks trying to get yeah. money, because yeah. a lot of them looked at her as, you're just one individual who has experience in this one area, why would I give you money, versus and the way I looked at it was, well, you're not a collective group trying to go in there buying into this idea. You have to sell it more than well, unfortunately for your mother, women are disadvantaged in the bank in the lending market. Um, I mean, women are denied women who have equal uh, capacity, and if you regress out all of the other details, age, education, experience, women still get loans half as likely as men do from from banks, especially larger banks. It's one reason community banks are, are helpful for women and minorities to a certain extent. Certain laws have made those uh, banks go away, which is an issue. So part of it is that you know she's out there as, as a woman and, and she's disadvantaged just by basis of bias. And if, if she were a corporation, even a female-led corporation, that would increase her chances just because she's not going to be uh, castigated in the same kind of way. So that was a particular aspect that affects you know only about 50% of the population. Uh, uh, but there is something to a sole proprietorship seeming more risky because 
that individual, uh, the, the, whole pro the whole company lives and dies, literally, with that individual. And so it, it cannot operate as a going concern without that individual. If it's, if, even if it's a, a corporation that's only owned by one person, if that person passes away, people can inherit the shares and continue operating the corporation. And so it, it has more as a going concern. Now, that said, banks probably won't lend to a brand new corporation either because they won't be able to collect for it. So in that case, though, the, the, the sole CEO, the sole um, investor, the sole owner could give a personal guarantee. And so you'll often find that banks will demand that personal guarantee for, for young companies. Like I mentioned, I have this little consulting business and I went out to get a uh, car and I had to sign both as president and personally fully on the hook for the, for the car payments because the business had only been operating for a year and didn't have a lot of assets and so they knew that if you know, they had to collect, that would be hard, easier to collect from a person. They were willing to sell the car to me, they're equally willing to have, you get, you get two bites of the apple then, right? You have two right. people on the hook for the liability and so that also helps. You can go after the business which has its assets or go after your mom and her assets. That's better than just being able to go after your mom. But um, it does speak to a broader societal issue that there are these, but there are ways around that. There are ways that you can, you know, it, it costs money, but then if you form a corporation, there are, there are, some, there are some benefits to that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you were a business undergrad, yes. Yeah, so. <laughs> The answer is probably yes, even just to, so to, to avoid some of the liabilities. If not, I mean, if I'm driving the company car on company business, even if I'm liable for the payments on that car, if, if, someone, if I get an accident in that car, at least I'm not then personally liable for that, right? So that, that, that liability shield can be helpful. Even if you get involved in some liability by essentially co-signing for certain debts, at least you've pushed off liability for certain torts and maybe other debts. Yes. Yes, it has an EIN number like my social security number and with enough history, with enough history, it, it does develop its own credit. I mean, Apple, no one needs to co-sign for Apple, right? And so obviously there's a huge difference, but you know, everyone starts somewhere, not that I will ever get there, that's simply not going to happen, but at least you can understand the continuum. And no, no one is co-signing for Apple because they have their, in fact, they, they public companies get a, a credit rating from agencies that specialize in that. But from what I understand, any entity with an EIN, an employer identification number, has a credit history, and the credit bureaus track that and provide like a FICO score for it. It wouldn't be, I don't think so. I mean, it's not my, I, I don't know for sure. My understanding is that an EIN is the same number of digits as a social, and often you, know, you plug it in in place of that. And I think that Fair Isaac and, and the Experian, TransUnion, and, and Equifax, they track the credit history of, of that EIN. And that EIN, that entity that's registered with the IRS in that, in that fa fashion, develops its own credit score, automated credit score. But no, I mean, I'm not going to get rated by Moody's anytime soon. Yeah, in fact, most private companies don't. Um, but, you know, private companies do borrow. I mean, Uber has, you know, entered into deals. Lending Club did this right before they went public, so if anyone really is interested, that document's actually available because Lending Club, as a private company, took on a $100 million debt, used that to buy a couple startups on a private-private deal, so a leverage, a leverage acquisition, and then went public and disclosed the, uh, the loan agreement. So if you're interested in seeing what a private company loan agreement and how, you know, and so instead of ratings, it's often like a lot of mechanisms like escrow agreements, and um, various uh, contractual provisions that effectively give the debt holder some control over the business and a lot of ways to call a default and, and pressure them because they don't have that credit information as much as a public company would. Uh, so a sole proprietorship is an option, but you know, often not going to be the, the best one. So those are gonna be your main choices and I'd like you to look at all of them. You, you know, obviously, uh, you, you, you know, there's reasons not to select one and then you can dispense with some of them quickly, but you know, especially on like kind of the first set as you go through the hypothetical, you know, you know go, go ahead and, and talk about all those choices, even the ones that you're going to rule out. Just rule them out quickly. Um, all right, so these planning considerations. What, what, are, what, are, the, uh, what are the owners uh, of this company thinking about? Let's go, let's now we've, again, that was our recap of last week. That was our kind of legal knowledge. So now we have to then go back to the business interests and we have to think about what are some business concerns that they would have? What are the, uh, 
What are the owner's interests in these entities and how is that going to factor in to the sort of business side of the equation, right? We're on both sides here, both lawyers and, and business people for a minute. And we want to ask some questions. How does the form handle minority interests? Do minority shareholders have any rights? Do they have lots of rights? Do they have equal rights? In a partnership, you know, person who gave the rake, the person who gave the lawnmower, the 5% and the 95%, they have equal rights. In a corporation, the minority has certain duties owed by the majority. In the partnership, in the LP, the minority does not have those rights. An LLC does not have those rights. Uh, so, you know, does the minority care about those rights and how does the form uh, have those rights? Does anyone care? How does the form affect the ability to raise capital? You know, as mentioned briefly, you know, a sole proprietorship, a general partnership may have more trouble raising capital than a corporation because the corporation is going to be around. You can still get liability from the owner. The LLC is a little less well understood, so harder to raise equity capital, but only certain businesses, basically only high growth businesses get equity capital. So if it's a high growth startup kind of company, you know, you need projections that say this is a $2 billion market. Like the companies that I showed you, right, the woman who's trying to revolutionize healthcare, uh, home, uh, home, uh, home child care, it's a $2 billion market opportunity, right? You can invest $25,000 now and it could be worth $300 million someday. You know, that's the prospect that you need to have to get the kind of investment because it's super risky to be an equity investor. You know, companies that are more like, I want to run a pizza shop, I want to start a bar, those are often going to be companies that need to get a loan and are just going to pay regular payments back. And by the way, I study crowdfunding. We don't talk about that here. It's new, but sort of another area where businesses in between can, can use crowdfunding to get some of this. And it doesn't seem like, from my research so far, crowdfunding investors don't seem to have any preference for corporations over LLCs. Maybe because they don't know the difference, although now you do, so you can check that. Out. So what do the owners want? The, the manner in which the interests are going to be handled is going to be a critical factor. Um, so for example, in a general partnership, how does a general partnership deal with uh, opportunistic behavior by the majority? What happens if the, you know, you have, you have two partners, uh, you have three partners and two gang up on the third, right? The, the difference of opinion or, or maybe the two are relatives and, you know, you can see that kind of issue happening in a small business. What happens in the partnership? Well, the only real right that the minority partner has is to force a dissolution or to, uh, in Pennsylvania, to disassociate and demand those assets, which can be relatively difficult. I mean, you're going to, you know, if your two partners don't agree with you and they're running the business in a different direction, um, you know, you're going to have to disassociate and then you're going to have to sue for an accounting and so it's kind of hard to, to get minority rights uh, in a partnership unless you craft a partnership agreement that, that sort of resolves that. In a, in a corporation, you know, generally the majority wins as well. I mean, you don't have a lot, of, a lot of rights as a minority shareholder in a corporation. You do have some duties. They can't totally take advantage of you. Like you can't sell uh, majority shares at one price and minority shares at a lower price. All the shares have to be sold at the same price. So there are some protections and, and rules, but um, you know, generally the corporation has the capital locked in. And then if you're a minority shareholder, you're going to have to live with management as well. So not a lot of rights there, probably less than a partnership. In a partnership, you can at least get your money out. Hard, but you can. And if you're a minority shareholder in a corporation, you better trust management because there's probably no one to sell those shares to. Interesting, because I am uh, current, yeah, and I love the prenup example. Uh, I, I don't have the answer to that because I actually have just started a research project on that question. And so what I've done is I've gotten a database of two-person startups. Two-person startups have this issue where they could easily disagree, and so the advice is not to form them, right? And so first thing I want to do is regress the numbers on that and see if they actually do fail more often or not. And I'm working with someone on the West Coast trying to get her involved and interested in this because I don't have the time. But she wanted to do a research project with uh, basically getting copies of their operating agreements and seeing if they had a provision for deadlock. It's sort of a, a, a way to deal with it in advance, right? And there's actually a concept called administrative contracting which would support that notion that there'd be some type of provision in advance for what happens when things go badly without resorting to the courts. So a formal mechanism right, to resolve this, kind of like, you know, now prenup is a little bit more court-based, but the analogy is still there. Um, if, if two people, you know, but there are sometimes administrative procedures that you can go through to avoid 
getting to the, the legal remedy. And so I guess my, that's my long-winded way of saying I'm interested in the question. I don't know the answer. But my suspicion is that companies have found a way to deal with these sort of deadlock issues in advance. And if we could only get our hands on enough of these operating agreements uh, and, and their bylaws and these shareholder agreements between 50-50 you know, shareholders, my hypothesis is that we would find that they had some type of, of agreement in advance. And the advice is out there to do it that way. But my question really is, is it a, is it a, is a legal prenup? in the sense that if things go badly, we agree for a 50-50 split, you know, or you keep the you know, salt shaker or whatever? Or, or is it more of an administrative provision where if we don't agree, we'll call our attorney, he'll flip a coin, and we'll do whatever he says and move forward, right? I, I actually tend to think that if we looked at the, all the literature that I've said has only the legal prenup concept, but I think if we looked at it, there'd probably be this administrative approach as well, where people have some kind of mechanism without resorting to the courts, without suing each other for resolving that. Arbitration. Like arbit yeah, like a binding arbitration, but I think something more informal, like, you know, like, a, like a, almost like moderated or, you know, but the example that I was given about this, by the way, was, uh, in a, and, and the way, where I started thinking about this was a, dealt with cost plus contracts. So it's not exactly this issue, but um, uh, you know, I might agree to sell you widgets. You might buy widgets from me, and, and we might say, uh, you'll, how much are you going to pay for them? We don't know how much widgets are going to cost because we don't know how much oil is going to be. So there's a lot of uncertainty. So maybe we agree that you'll pay 5% more than my cost, so I get some profit. That's called a cost plus a agreement. And that sounds great on paper, right? Because that's really easy, right? And that a price I always make 5%. You decide to buy the widgets or not. You know, you're not getting ripped off. There's a problem. The problem is, what if I'm inflating my cost? And there's lots of ways. What if, I, what if my costs are high because I'm paying myself a million dollar a year salary and I add that to my cost? So we had this issue here and a lot of cost plus contracts end up getting litigated because of this issue about unfairness. So we're seeing that some of these cost plus contracts have this mechanism that says basically every year on January 1st, an accounting firm is going to come in, review the books, and tell you what cost is. So that's an administrative mechanism, right? We're not actually going to sue about it. I mean, you could sue if you didn't allow the accounting firm in the door. But we've essentially appointed the administrator, the accounting firm, to come in, resolve the cost issue in advance of the problem, and make sure the problem doesn't happen. So it is formal, but it's not legal. And it might be something that we see in founder agreements, too. All right. Why are people doing this? What are they trying to accomplish? Are they trying to uh, raise money? Are they trying to start a, uh, a huge, uh, sweeping, growing uh, startup firm? Or are they just trying to run a lifestyle business? Do they have the cash? You know, So there, that sort of basis is going to really be informative as well. The advice that I usually give, if you're looking to raise outside money, you have to form a corporation. You have to form a corporation in order to attract significant amounts of outside capital. You should form a Delaware corporation. If you're a Pennsylvania company, you might think it's a good idea to form a Pennsylvania LLC. I'll enjoy tax benefits for a little while. If you plan on becoming a billion-dollar company, you're probably going to start by losing money. And if you're losing money, who cares about double taxation? There is no tax on losses. In fact, we'll talk about tax a little more in a minute, but you know, corporations get to use those taxes, those losses in later years to offset their gains. So. Uh, if you plan on raising a lot of money, if you're going to lose money for a while, the benefit of, of being an LLC is, is really diminished. And if you need to raise outside capital, the conversion costs are there. Um, investors will still demand that you convert. Not all the time, but less and less, but still most of the time. Um, yeah, so tax issues. Let's talk about the tax issues in specific. We'll talk about this double taxation. I'm going to show it to you. Uh, it, it's, it does involve some math. I've tried to make the math as simple as possible. Uh, it follows what's in the book, uh, so you can kind of refer back to it. But you know, whether you have a corporation that makes an S election or a partnership or an LLC that's treated as a partnership, you have something called flow-through tax, meaning only the owners pay the tax. The company doesn't, is not visible as a tax entity. It doesn't have to pay the IRS. And so that can help in many cases where there's profit, because otherwise the profit gets taxed when the corporation makes the profit. And then if those profits get distributed to the shareholders, they get taxed again on those dividends. And let me show you what that looks like from a simple scenario of there being uh, gain or profit. 
So this is a really simple version of, of, of a balance uh, sheet or income statement rather. And um, you know, this is our, our, our income statement. Uh, and we have a net income here uh, of $80,000. And by the way, when you see parentheses, that's a negative. So this is a positive number. The business income here is $80,000. The numbers are in thousands. That's what the triple zero means. Very brief how to read a balance statement for those of you who haven't seen it. Triple zero means we're going to put those three zeros after each number in the column. Uh, losses in parentheses. So here the company is making money. It's both paying people salaries. But what's different here is that third line item. You see that the business is going to pay a tax on that, on that $80,000. So... If the business is paying tax on that $8,000, it actually has left less afterwards to then dividend out. And so we deduct that corporate level taxation from the amount of money left in the account, and then we give the rest to the shareholders. Let's say they want to take all the profits for the year, or in case of partners, all the partners, they're going to take their share. Well, since there was no tax at the partnership level, the entire $80 flows through. But in the case of the corporation, there was a tax at the corporate level. So that, that tax gets paid, and now $64.50 remains. And so the amount of income uh, actually received in the case of a corporation is less. Now, that does mean, of course, that the amount of tax each person pays on that income is less. If you receive $150,000, uh, that's, by the way, that's profits plus salary. Right? The owner here is paying themselves a salary of 70 as well as receiving uh, 80 uh, in, the, in the share, a total of 150. And so uh, we're going to say that's a $13.50 tax. If a person actually only receives $134,500, $134, they clearly pay less tax on that money than if they earned 150, right? Tax is a percentage basis. And so the personal tax is less, but again, you started with uh, uh, you started with less money. When you add the two taxes together, the double tax, you really see how it hits here, and the corporation pays almost twice the amount of tax as the partnership in a situation where there is significant profits that are distributed to the shareholders. So this is the problem of double taxation. And we have a problem with taxation even if the company bears a loss. And so here's a, a loss scenario. And again, a loss is represented by those, uh, those brackets uh, around the income or loss. So the company here has lost $20, but again, the person has paid uh, uh, 70,000 uh, in salary. And so the partnership, they both have uh, losses. Personal income remains at 70. And uh, the partnership is not taxed. So the, uh, the, the person who receives the, uh, the partner receives the loss. The loss passes through as well. So both profits and losses pass through, and so that loss actually reduces the taxable income of the partner. And so the partner, since the business lost 20,000 and the person made 70, their net gain is 50. 70 minus the 20, because the losses, the business does not see profit or loss. It goes through to the partner. And in this case, those losses pass through. Those losses are valuable. They offset taxable income. And so taxable income is decreased in the case of the partnership to 50000 In the corporation, those losses stay with the corporation. Those losses, just like the profits, are, are at the corporate level. And so that personal income tax remains on the $70,000 salary. Those losses do not carry forward. And so in both the profit and the loss scenario, the corporation shareholder pays more tax than the partnership partner. And so there is a missing piece, however, which is that this is only a one-year balance sheet. And as I mentioned, corporations can pass their losses forward and offset future gains. So the picture gets more complicated over a five-year period. But we're not in tax class today, so I only need you to get to here. Right? We're not taking the five-year approach. This is the snapshot approach, the one-year, one-time deal. And so if you can understand this chart, you can see how in both the situation where there is a gain, where there is a profit, that profit would be taxed twice, and so the corporation pays more on the corporate shareholder, ends up with less in their pocket at the end of the day, and even in a loss situation, because the losses also pass through the partnership but not the corporation, even in a loss scenario, the partner earns more than 
the business. So you might think, all right, let's always form a pass-through entity. Well, there's reasons not to do that or reasons that you can avoid it. There are two major ways to avoid this double tax. And they're not always available. But if you can do it, you can have the simplicity and structure of a corporation as well as the very reliable rules and law and make an S election or zero out your income in order to avoid this double tax treatment and end up with the same scenario as a partnership, same tax scenario. So the two ways to do this are called zeroing out income, which I'll talk about second actually, and forming it as an S corporation and make it, or making an S election. Now I'm actually oversimplifying. There are some differences between S corporations and partnerships with regard to tax. They're minor. This isn't tax class. You don't need to worry about the differences. We're going to talk about an S corporation as having the tax structure of a partnership. And that partnership side of the chart I just showed you, that's going to apply to S corporations for our simple purposes here. But just know, going out in the world, that S corporations and partnerships do have different tax rules and tax is complicated. All right. But how do you make the election? Well, you can make an S election if, if the following things are true. And by the way, if any of them become not true at any point, the election is what's called blown. And so the conversion from an S corp to a C corp can happen at any time without you even realizing it. And you can have all this tax liability you didn't realize. So that's a real risk with an S corporation. It can be blown at any time. And it's hard to go the other way. You, to go from a C corp to an S corp, you have to deal with a lot of tax payments. So the IRS is trying to, the IRS always gets its pound of flesh one way or another, right? So, so they've figured out all the ways that people have needled around this. In any event, we're just talking about the formation decision. And at the formation stage, when can you make an S election? Well, you need it to be a domestic corporation or a LLC, same, you know, uh, it has to be domestic with no more than 100 shareholders. 100 shareholders or less. You have 101 shareholders, the S election is blown. Now, in a small business, the ones that we're going to be looking at for the next couple of days, we're not going to have 100 shareholders anytime soon, but this happens. This happened to Facebook, not in the S election status, but Facebook hit a certain number of shareholders because it had, it had several institutional shareholders. The shareholders began selling their shares, and so one shareholder, if you have 100 shares, you can sell them to 100 individuals. And so some of the large institutional shareholders, I'm sorry, I think I mentioned that, Facebook, I said Facebook? Yes, Facebook. Uh, and Facebook went public before analysts thought it would, before it probably should have, and famously, it ended the IP. There was this whole craze of going public, and all these companies were going public, and people were making lots of money in 2011, 2012, and Facebook kind of killed that trend. Facebook went public, and the stock price went down. It didn't get the IPO pop. Something went wrong in that transaction. And the speculation, which I think is right, is they went public before they wanted to, because they had to make public disclosures because they hit a 500 shareholder limit. When you get enough shareholders and they have a number of shares of stock, especially if they have the ability to transfer their assets, they may sell their shares to multiple people. And if you have 99 shareholders and you don't have a way to control them, that can easily become 100, 102, 104. It happened to Facebook. That probably is why they ended up having to get rid of some of their shares. It can happen if you have uh, uh, um, stock options. Anyway, S corporations, less, number one, less than 100 shareholders, 100 shareholders or less. Yes? Can you contractually enjoin shareholders from selling? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. You can put transfer restrictions on the shares. But I'll tell you what, investors don't like it. So if you want to restrict those shares, investors will pay you less for them. Because something you can sell is worth more than something you can't. The less liquidity you have in something diminishes its value. Right? And in fact, when uh, I, I've worked with firms that value private companies, and they often apply what's called an illiquidity discount of 40 to 60 percent, and they just cut the value of the shares by 40 to 60 percent because they are hard to sell. But those restrictions can be found in the bylaws, apply to the company as a whole. They can be found in the certificate of incorporation, or there can be just contractual one-on-one. -on -one shareholder agreements that um, restrict their transfer of shares. Um, that can take the form of a right of first refusal, uh, right of first offer. There are lots of different flavors. An outright requirement of the, of the corporation sort of, you know, approving of a share. Yes? 
Yes, you can, but um, it doesn't always, doesn't always work out. All right, next, the other aspect is all the shitters have to be individuals, natural human beings. They have to be, again, uh, less than 100 of them, and they all have to be individuals. Uh, or kind of odd uh, tax-exempt entities and qualified trusts and things. But let's just focus on the individual nature of it because that means they can't be other firms and they can't be C-corporations, right? Because that would actually block the tax. And so the IRS is saying you can't do that. The shareholders cannot be non-resident aliens. They have to either be resident aliens or they have to be citizens. And so the uh, Shah of Iran cannot be an investor and keep your S election, right? He's over there living in Iran doing his Shah thing, and so he can't be an investor, he'd blow the election. And as soon as someone transfers a share to the Shah, boom, the election's blown at that moment. The corporation can only also have one class of stock, and we talked a little bit about the kind of Series A, Series B, Series C concept. You, have, you could have, uh, Google has voting shares, or I think, Class A and Class B, one has like 10 times the votes of the other. There are all kinds of different ways you could set that up. An S corporation can only have one class of stock. It can only have one class of stock. And so that's another restriction. And so that may make it hard to get venture investment. They want preferences. They want liquidation rights, et cetera. By the time that you're big enough to, to uh, uh, well, first off, reorganizing as S corp is very expensive from a tax basis. It's easy to go the other way. But it's very, very hard to become, it's very hard to go from a tax entity to a non-tax entity. You have to deal with a lot of IRS garbage to go through that process. And if you're at the point where you have a hostile takeover threat, you probably have more than 100 shareholders anyway. There aren't that many, I don't know if there's, I don't know if there's any public companies or even companies that are large enough of consequence that have that few shareholders that are facing that kind of threat. Um, I haven't seen that as a, as, as a particular type of takeover defense. Uh, and uh, all the shareholders have to consent to the S treatment. So we actually have five requirements, and they're not always met, but they are frequently met, right? We have to have 100 or fewer shareholders. They all have to be individuals or tax-exempt individuals. They have to be not, they cannot be non-resident aliens. They can be resident aliens or citizens, but they have to be, essentially, they have to be U.S. tax-paying individuals. And there's only one class of stock, and they have to uh, consent. The second method of eliminating tax liability is zeroing out income. And this, is, this, can, be, uh, this can be effective, but uh, it's not always possible as well. The IRS has gotten wise to this. This is not a tax class. This is a corporations class. You need to understand some basic tax concepts. So the limits on zeroing out income is an advanced tax concept. You can learn that in corporate taxation. But the method is actually fairly simple. You incur expenses equal to your losses, and the profits go away. If you have expenses equal to your losses, your profit is what? Zero. So how can you increase your expenses? Well, why don't we increase salaries? If we have one shareholder who's also the owner and the CEO and he's making 70000 a year, and in this year they made 80000 in profit in addition to his 70000 salary, maybe we issue him a bonus for $80,000. That would take the income down to zero. Now, there are reasons why the IRS is wise to this, and they actually tax bonuses at a higher amount, and there's all kinds of issues with doing this fraudulently, yada, yada, yada. But the concept itself is actually pretty simple. If you don't have tax at a corporate level because you've spent all of your profits and incurred all those losses, there's no corporate profits to tax. Uh, and so as a result, uh, you know, we have to, uh, we, we, can, we can zero out that income in some cases by effectively spending all of the profits on business uh, uh, expenses. All right, I think that's all my comments I have on that. Uh, yes? Is that only to like, the officers that can take on dividends? Do they do dividends? No, they, they, dividends are different. Because dip, so in order for it to be so, it's sort of like the profit, so this is the corporation. And so at the end of the year, you could think of it at the end of the year if they have money left over. Some of that goes to tax. And then some of what's left after that can go to the shareholders as dividends. 
And so we're trying to forego that by taking the money out of the corporation before the tax is paid. Dividends are paid, always paid, after the tax is paid on them. That's sort of just the nature of a dividend. So we can't do this method by dividending out the, the profits because, they're, well, they're profits at that point. We have to essentially make this not profitable. We have to make the company unprofitable, not necessarily at a loss, but we have to get that income to zero. And so we're going to have to incur expenses, which are different than making a profit and then distributing that profit in a two-step process that does hit tax. Yes? So it might be encouraging to like expand, therefore create loss? Yeah, yeah. I mean, definitely. I mean, if a corporation has, a lo has earned a lot of money that year, it might make sense for it to spend that on an acquisition. But then again, maybe that will generate even more uh, taxable income in a future year. So tax planning is definitely much more complicated than we're going to get into today. And zeroing out income is not available in a lot of cases. And if we're not in an arm's length transaction, the IRS will disallow the deduction and treat this as a, if, if in fact this situation were to happen, while in theory this sounds nice, this is obviously an end run around the tax. If the IRS sees you doing this, it will impute the bonus payment as a dividend. Just because you call it a bonus payment, if there's one shareholder and he earns 70000 a year and offer and pays himself the entire profits as a bonus payment and calls it an expense, because you call it an expense doesn't mean the IRS is going to honor that. The IRS will come back and disallow that deduction and impute it as a dividend, forcing tax recognition on it, usually with penalties and interest. So during that income is not a, 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 a legal choice because of tax ramifications in, in most instances. All right, we have about 20 minutes left, and hopefully that's enough to go through our hypos. So let me step through this a little bit and, and kind of talk you through what I'm, I'm looking for now that we've gotten sort of our, our background about this. So here's our main choices. We have all these different entity choices and our smorgasbord of our alphabet soup of choices here. And so let's, you know, we have our hypothetical. We have Brandon, who has managerial skills, no money, uh, technical training. We have Anita, who's a full-time journalist and has some cash as well as some financial knowledge. Uh, Anita then, we have the additional fact, Anita wants to hire Brandon to work for her. And Brandon wants to earn a salary. He wants a, he wants a salary and Anita wants to uh, hire Brandon to work for her. Does that limit some of our choices? What can we rule out? Partnerships. We are going to rule out the partnerships, right? There's, this is not a partnership structure. Neither an LP nor a GP makes sense anymore. So we can cut those off because Anita has made it clear she wants to have an employee, not a partner. She doesn't want to give him control. All right. As far as the other uh, uh, entity choices, you know, I think they're still on the table. So we need to then step through them. So we still have the corporation, whether we can make the S election, Depends on, we'd want to ask questions about Anita's tax situation, the profitability of the company, chances for outside investment. Um, so, but we're pretty sure here Anita does not want the equality of a partnership, right? So we're going to rule out the partnership. More centralized management makes sense. So are we going to pick the LLC in this case? Well, it's a possibility, but again, what are we getting out of the LLC? I mean, it's a single member LLC. So it's not expensive to set up. So we don't have the cost complexity issue commonly associated with it. We do have some flexible tax basis. Sounds like an LLC is a very good choice in this case, so long as Anita wants to remain the sole owner indefinitely. If she wants to bring other people into that enterprise, it's much harder to then, she would have to then convert it to a multi-member LLC, write a, a complicated operating agreement, and convince people to buy units in, a, in an LLC, that's all much harder. So we're going to want to ask Anita if she intends to run this business as the sole owner forever, in which case a single member LLC is probably the best choice because we have very, very clear pass-through tax. We don't have to worry about the S election. There's, you know, it's even simpler than the corporation. We have fewer formalities. But if there's any inkling that Anita is going to want to bring on other partners uh, in the future, you know, maybe the uh, LLC is going to be more trouble than it's worth. And we would then also ask, okay, so how about an S corporation? We want to know uh, about Anita's residency. It sounds like under these facts that she is at least a U.S. Uh, taxpayer, whether she's a citizen or not, but we would probably want to ask her 
that question. If she is, in fact, a citizen, she could form an S corporation. And the advantage of that is if she does want future investment, she can very easily flip to a C corporation. It, it, it eventually happens automatically. Or for that matter, maintain the flow through status if the new shareholders also uh, uh, consent. I was going to ask what happens to an, a uh, single member LLC if, or after Anita dies? Uh, so it is separately owned from her. So she, someone, w if she devised or uh, had some inheritance for it, it would flow to whoever would inherit it. If she tried to devise it to multiple people, now we have the complexity of a, essentially a structure that doesn't fit the function, and uh, and there would have to either have to be reworked, or it would probably simply dissolve. I mean, if she because you, I mean, it, it has only one unit. So, in fact, you know that she. If she tried to, she would try to split the unit in half. Uh, I don't even, I don't know if the, it would even be honored. I mean, it just wouldn't function. But yeah, she, I mean, it is a separate entity. So if she dies, someone can inherit that. So I think under this first situation, you know, we've ruled out a couple things. Um, you know, and we, we probably also want to address the sole proprietorship. We have a single owner. Well, I think we want to counsel Anita that she could do that. It would be virtually free, but she has unlimited liability. Does she want to take on that level of personal risk? What type of liabilities is this business potentially going to incur? I mean, if Brandon's up on the roof and he falls off, you could sue her for a million bucks. Does she want to take that kind of liability? Look, if she does and she, she doesn't want to pay your bill, she doesn't want to spend 2,000 bucks to avoid the chance of a $5 million lawsuit, that's fine. That's not a client you want. Let her walk out the door, but advise her of it. Give her her options. All right, another scenario. Uh, let's turn a little bit. So now let's say Brandon will uh, wants to own the business, and he wants to uh, borrow the money from Anita. So he's going to run the business, he's going to operate the business, he's going to own the business, and he's going to borrow the startup capital from Anita. So uh, what are some uh, entity choices here? What, are, what can we rule out? Well, why? Why would so? I don't agree with that, as you can probably tell by my response. Why, why, so, but tell me why you would rule out a sole proprietorship here? Because I had to make up the answer pretty quick. Ah, uh -huh. <laughs> you had a different question. So, yeah. I, I think the easier thing to rule out here, once again, is the partnership. But nothing here says there's any right. Brandon wants to run the company. He wants to own the business. He wants to be the sole owner. This is not a partnership. He does not want Anita to be his partner. We're going to rule the partnership. Now, the sole proprietorship, we have similar issues with liability, but you know, we could talk about how Anita would probably ask for Brandon to guarantee it anyway. So probably not going to have additional debt liability. Same liability as before, but now he's the one on the roof. He's not going to sue himself. So we're actually probably a little more comfortable with the sole proprietorship here than in the previous scenario because there's no employees. And so there's no respondeat superior liability. There's no risk of torts from someone else. If he falls off the roof, he's not going to sue himself. So actually, we have the same analysis, but a sole proprietorship is more likely here than the uh, more more colorable here than the last one because there are fewer liabilities for Brandon. So these like build on each other, or they completely different? Because I feel like now a limited partnership would be what you would want. Because if she still wants to kind of own it, he wants to now have ownership interest. Okay, so someone here. Tell Tyler, why doesn't the limited partnership work here? What is the fact here that precludes a limited partnership? Does Anita want profits? No, she wants to be a lender. He wants to borrow the money, right? And so under this particular situation, the financial arrangement they want is that Anita is going to be repaid over time and then go away. Whereas a limited partnership, you live with them forever, right? That's not what Brand is asking for here. That's not what Brandon's asking for. We haven't opened up the door quite that far yet because she, and, and we don't have any inkling that Anita wants a share in the profits. She might be happy with 12% interest. And in fact, that might, you know, depending on her position, that may be a safer, it is certainly, it's always safer because you're guaranteed some kind of income stream. You become an LP in this business, you may never see that cash again. She'd like to see those regular payments. And so Actually, the LP is going to be ruled out for, for the same reasons as before. The corporation's available, same reasons as before. Same logic applies here to the corporation. We want to ask again, is Brandon a, 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 a resident or a, a taxpayer? You know, does he intend on bringing on other partners in the future? Same considerations with that as well, same analysis. 
But actually here, the difference in the way we changed this hypothetical is we reduced the liability on Brandon as a sole proprietor, so we made the sole proprietorship somewhat more appealing because there's no employee to worry about and because we have, we're going to assume that Anita would require a personal guarantee of the debt anyway, so he doesn't have any additional debt liability. Yes? If Brent, yeah, yeah, but if he was expecting to hire an employee in the future, since a sole proprietorship is so darn cheap, maybe he just wants to operate for a little bit and then uh, come back later and pay your legal fees once he's successful enough to hire an employee and start to grow a little bit. But again, not a bad idea to start him off as a single member LLC if he doesn't want to ever bring on other investors or as a partner, as a corporation right now, if he might and wants additional liability protection. I mean, if he's running up and sticking you know, heavy equipment on people's roofs, maybe that is a smart idea for him to do even now. My point only was that compared to the previous hypothetical, sole proprietorship has moved up in our rating scale just a little bit because we don't have to worry about the employee getting injured and unlimited liability from that and because the money is coming from a debt that you're going to probably have to guarantee personally anyway. All right, um, Anita and Brandon decide, okay, you know, let's, uh, let's split the profits 50-50. Let's split the management 50-50. That sounds fair. We're both going to, you know, uh, we're, we're going to split the profits. You know, we might have different roles. I'll be the CFO. you be the CEO. You'll take care of the sales. I'll take care of the finances. And we want to share the profits half-half. Uh, we want to share the, and we both want to be involved in the daily management. So what can we rule out if they both want to be involved in the daily management? Absolutely, right? That's the, the two people. It can absolutely cannot be a sole proprietorship. There's another one. Limited partnership. And a limited partnership. Why the limited partnership? A little more technical there. Just because the tax scenario that you provided is giving them equal profit, equal responsibility, so it wouldn't, one partner would not be limited. I mean, first off, this isn't an investment fund, so we're not going to jump to the LP. Plus, Right? I mean, under Pennsylvania law, the LP can't be involved in management. So unless you want to violate Pennsylvania law from day one, you can't form an LP and have the LP manage that business. It's illegal under Pennsylvania law. So it's clearly the wrong structure here. Uh, a general partnership, though, this looks a lot like a general partnership because 50-50 management, 50-50 vote, that's the default rule. So they can actually go into business tomorrow and have exactly that structure they want without paying you a cent. What's the downside? What's the reason not to form a general partnership? Unlimited liability. Unlimited liability. They both are fully responsible for all the debts and towards the business. Maybe Brandon's a jerk and Anita is going to end up having a million dollar you know, uh, settlement against her because he you know, drove the truck through somebody's uh, front, front uh, door or what have you. you know, and, and we have a person that has a significant amount of money, a person that has very little money, so Anita's got a bit of a target on her back for lawsuits, so that's a real bit of a risk for her that we probably want to make sure she's aware of. And they might have different risk profiles. I mean, there's lots of reasons to think that someone is young and male and broke and someone who's older and female and wealthy have different risk preferences. And if those risk preferences don't match up, one of them might be either unhappy that the business is not taking risks that it should, or on the other <laughs> hand, unhappy that it's taking risks that are perceived as too dangerous. Yeah. Uh, for the limited partnership, you said that the limited partner cannot be involved in the management processes of the company. Yes. Is that like absolute, or if they were, say, if they were to say under the letter of Pennsylvania law, it is absolute. It's not even. They couldn't even say, "I want ten percent management responsibility." That's correct. Zero. That's correct. That's correct. And we're going to take the simple approach here and just take the Pennsylvania law on its face. Now, it turns out there's really no teeth to that rule in that if a person does do that, they don't end up incurring liability necessarily because of it. But it's not how that organizational structure is designed. And we're not going to create an organization that's going to be violating you know, state law from day one. Yes? I just have a question about unlimited liability. Can't you buy liability insurance? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. You can definitely buy liability insurance. But it's not free, right? And, and, uh, and it's, it doesn't always protect you completely. And there could be deductibles and caps and phase-outs and, and things like that. So sure, there are other ways to limit liability 
uh, in addition to the limited liability form. Yes, Michael. Could um, Brent, Brandon indemnify Adidas, or is that not allowed? Yes, uh, so we'll talk more about indemnification when we talk about directors. And it's a little bit more of a specific question, but yes, he could agree that if she's sued, he would step into her shoes and, and maybe that would make her feel more comfortable. But, but again, like, why? Yeah. Why don't we just form a corporation? Or for that matter, in this case, maybe this is a good example of where we should form an LLC. I mean, a corporation, it's a little bit weird to have a corporation with this structure where they're both gonna be owners and both be managers. That's not really how it's designed. This is one of those cases where an LLC is looking pretty appealing. Right? They want to have limited liability. They both want to manage the business. They both want to have a, a share in the profits. They actually are probably making different contributions, so their contributions and their profit share are not connected. In a corporation, those are connected. In a corporation, you contribute 10%, you get 10%. Here, we know that Anita has money and Brandon does not have money. They are probably not contributing the same amount. It's the rake and the lawnmower example. 5%, 95%, but we still want 50% of the profits at the end. Here, the LLC's flexibility is starting to look a little bit more appealing, and it might actually be worth it, because we can give them that structure. We can give them joint management rights, regardless of their contribution. We can give them joint profit rights and loss rights, regardless of their contribution, and we can protect them both from liability. So this is probably a good scenario for an LLC, but a corporation is plausible, it's just a little clunky because now we have people that are both 50% owners and 50% directors and now we've got like a board of directors and meetings and all sorts of things for a structure which is really, actually now the corporation is looking pretty complicated versus something, we really want a partnership with limited liability where both people participate. And that effectively is an LLC, a manager, a member managed LLC where they're both members. So we have that structure here. And, and since it's 50-50, 50-50 everything, that isn't too terribly complicated. Yes? Is that why LLCs began, just to solve that kind of problem? Yeah, they, they solved the problem of having to form an LP and, a, and then the GP would be a corporation. You have all this complicated structure when you really wanted a partnership and you wanted to limit, the, limit liability. Yeah. Yeah, they're, they became very popular for that sort of thing. And even law firms have adopted that model where they're permitted under state law, under uh, ABA uh, ethics rules. Yeah. I guess just the other advice would be to make sure that the 50-50 the split has some kind of way to break a tie. Right. Going back to the deadlock concept. Yeah, so I think you want to throw in there. Anytime you have a 50-50 founder you know, situation, you do have the issue that if they don't agree, the company doesn't move forward. So I think that is right. And again, area of kind of evolving research, but having some type of deadlock provision is helpful. But any of these forms, if they deadlock perpetually, can have a, an a judicial disillusion and terminate the company because of uh, getting into loggerheads, so to speak. All right, let's do another one. Um, let's say Anita will provide the capital. Brandon will manage the business but they both want to share the profits. Not necessarily 50-50, but uh, you know, they want some type of profit share. Brandon doesn't want to be an employee, and Anita doesn't want to be a, a, a lender. She wants to share the profits, but she's going to come up with the money, and he's going to provide the labor. What types of structures can we rule out here? Well, this is a little more open-ended, right? One thing we can definitely rule out is the sole proprietorship. Once again, that structure doesn't make sense for sharing profits. We're not gonna use a sole proprietorship for any type of sharing profits. We could have a GP structure for the reasons sort of listed above, but um, you know, when we have one person who's passive and one person who's active, we're sort of begging the question of maybe an LP does fit here. You know, but then the problem with an LP we want to address is, as we've mentioned, Brandon has unlimited liability. Just because he's managing the business doesn't want to be liable for everything. So we turn to the LLC and the corporation. Now, corporation actually seems to make sense here because we've separated ownership and control. And uh, the problem is that if they want to share profits under a corporate structure, it's a little clunky. Anita is providing all the money. She's going to own all of the shares. She's going to hire Brandon to be the CEO. So now they have to come up with some kind of relatively complicated revenue and profit sharing agreement where he gets some share of the profits even though and doesn't get dividended out. And corporation is actually a little complicated here. So an LLC again looks like this is sort of a good choice because under the LLC structure, 
they can act like a partnership, and one of them can be the manager. We can have a man this would be a better candidate for a manager managed LLC. In the last case where they're both equal, they could both be members and both have equal rights. Now we have one manager, Brandon, and a member, but they're both uh, able to share those profits. And so here again, we see that the LLC's flexibility is helpful, uh, but um, you know, we, could, we could have a corporation as well. The problem is, is in a corporation, how would you structure it that they split profits where one is the 100% owner and one is the manager? That's an unusual structure. You'd have to come up with some kind of contractual remedy for that. All right, um, I'm close to the end, but should I, should I do one more before we break? No? Yes? Yeah. All right, do one more. All right, the last one. Anita provides all the money and co-manages with Brandon. Now we've really eliminated a couple options. If Anita's providing all the money and co-managing, we know that an LP is ruled out. Right? If she's co-managing, we can now have an LP. We rule up the sole proprietorship, again, co-managing, and again, uh, sharing the profits. Both of those are unfeasible, not possible in a, uh, in a sole proprietorship. Uh, so we could look at a partnership, uh, a corporation, or an LLC. Those are going to be our kind of, again, they you know, keep coming up. A partnership would allow them to share the profits and control, but... Just like in every other case, how about that unlimited liability? How about those different risk profiles? How about the fact this is a business that could go out in the world and cause some injuries and incur some debts? And so we're going to be careful about encouraging the general partnership in this case. Again, we have the LLC, right? The LLC makes sense here because we could have a, a member-managed situation. The LLC, again, it's flexibility coming to bear on this situation where you know, one wants to provide all the capital. Now, we don't know how they want to share the profits. If in fact, if in fact Anita is going to keep all the profits, then a corporation is definitely the way to go. It's simple, right? We're going to have Anita uh, provide the capital. She can appoint herself. We can have two directors on the board. She can be the she can be the CEO. She can be an employee. Once we get into profit sharing, though, profit sharing between a you know in a corporation where people are contributing different amounts of capital is hard and we have to have some kind of complicated relationship for it. All right, so uh, just to wrap then, organizational choices are really on a continuum. You know, from, uh, from partnerships to corporations and LLCs in between. LLCs are in between in the sense that they can have attributes of either, but that flexibility comes at a cost in a lot of situations. However, it really can pay off. It can give you the flexibility you need to achieve certain business ends. There are several kinds of partnerships, general partnerships and limited partnerships are the ones we're going to care about here. Limited liability partnerships, what law firms use. So if you see a law firm, that's the entity choice you need to go to because you cannot preclude a lawyer from having malpractice liability. A professional corporation is also an option, but not in every state. Um, corporations uh, can be publicly traded. The ones we're dealing with here are closely held. Uh, and so they have different uh, management rights, but they still have the concept of centralized management, separation of ownership and control. And so that makes them very clean and easy for certain applications, particularly when you have investors that will come and go, when you have centralized management, professional management. Uh, but uh, if you have a kind of a funky situation, a small business that's not going to raise outside capital, that has uh, a, a kind of an unusual contribution and profit sharing agreement, you might need to go to the LLC so that flexibility allows you to meet their business needs. All right, that's it for today. Thanks for the extra two minutes and 20 seconds. Uh, I'll give it back to you one of these days. Uh, and uh, next week we're going to come back and we're going to deal with formation issues. So please read that section. A couple couple pages in there, and then we'll workshop it the following week. So, thanks.